And now we get to Pico de la Mirandola. Uh, let's look a little bit at the background of Pico. He was born right in the middle of the Quattrocento, that's the 14th, uh, from 1400 to 1499 in Italy, uh, and to a noble Italian family. Pico was very precocious in his language abilities and had an excellent education that set him on a world stage at the early age of 24. Having absorbed a massive amount of learning and insight, he hoped to defend no less than 900 theses against all who would dispute them, and all of this in Rome, no less. The disputation of these conclusions, that was the work, was called the conclusions, did not occur due to Innocent VIII's rejection of them as heretical. But his introduction to these 900 theses is known as the Oration of the Dignity of Man enjoyed a wide readership, and it would merit your attention. You're going to read a small sample of that. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the content of the oration and its, uh, its main themes. Uh, Pico's enduring reputation today as a quintessential Italian humanist from the Quattrocento comes from this work known as the oration. It's really a speech. It's a speech for humanity. It's pro humanitatis. It was a speech he never got to deliver, but it was widely read after it was printed. He passionately appeals to principles and teachings, concepts that Pico absorbed from various sources, such as the Corpus Hermeticum, written by Hermes Trismegistus. Pico was an inveterate Platonist. He was uh, trained by Marsilio Ficino, who had translated Plato's works into Italian, I'm sorry, uh, into Latin, and uh, he had been educated by Ficino. And so uh, he is an inveterate Platonist. He has a very Neoplatonic view of the world. Now, Neoplatonism and Platonism, uh, Neoplatonism is kind of an extreme form of Platonism, if you will. And so it's, uh, it's very mystical. Again, it goes back to this idea that this world is simply a kind of a projection out of another world that is more real than this one, the world of the universals and the forms. Pico prided himself on being able to reconcile vastly different schools of thought, such as Plato and Aristotle. Uh, he claims that Plato and Aristotle really did not disagree with each other. We could think of him almost as a kind of a forerunner of the discipline that we call today comparative religions. In his project of synthesizing or syncretizing, uh, he finds some precedent, in, this finds some precedent in uh, Aquinas's massive Summa Theologica, which achieves a full synthesis of Aristotelian and Christian thought. Okay, let's focus on the oration itself. Pico's oration blends elements of Christianity, Kabbalah, mystery religions, Hermeticism, Platonism, Aristotelianism, and reason itself into a treatise on humanity's nature and humanity's dignity. What exactly is a human being? Well, for Pico, this is a very powerful question. He has a powerful answer to it. And the worldview analysis finds this answer in Pico. Quote, man is the intermediary between creatures that he is the familiar of the gods above him as he is the Lord of things beneath him. He is the interpreter of nature set midway between the timeless unchanging and the flux of time, a being worthy of all admiration. So for Pico, humanity stands in a unique position between heaven and between earth, between the angels and between the, an between the animals. By free will, a person must choose to return to the base nature of animals ruled by passion and drives or choose to ascend to ethereal and timeless divine nature. It's up to you. You have complete free will and you can revert back to your animal nature or you can ascend to angelic nature through your choice. And you were intended to be an angel. You were intended to be a high being, nearly godlike but it's up to you to choose this. Every other creature stands fixed in its cosmic position without hope or ability to transcend it. For example, the animals, they have no ability to choose. They must stay within their animal nature. Angels, likewise, they have to stay within their angelic nature. Neither one of these has the ability to choose. Only Adam and Eve 
occupy a center cosmic order. They're in the center of the cosmos. And so the whole cosmic order is centered on the human. They have a gift that no other creature possesses, and that's freedom of will to either ascend to their angelic nature or descend into their animal nature. God says to Adam, I have placed you at the very center of the world. We have made you a creature neither of heaven nor of earth, neither mortal nor immortal, in order that you may, as the free and proud shaper of your own being, fashion yourself in the form that you may prefer. It will be in your power to descend to the lower brutish forms of life, and you will be able to, through your own decision, to rise again to the superior orders whose life is divine. So free will enables humanity to rise above their base nature that they share with plants and animals. Pico employs Aristotle's tripartite view of the soul here. If we cultivate the intellect, we will become angels and sons of God. Aristotle held that there were three parts to the soul. There was the, essentially the, the vegetative soul, and we share that with plants. And then there was the, uh, the, the ultimately the, the rational soul that we share uh, only with angels. Uh, but clearly, Pico weds Platonic and Aristotelian views of human nature to the doctrine of salvation. So in other words, the way to salvation is through your choice. This kind of makes him or puts him within a Pelagian view of human beings, a Pelagian uh, theological position. What is Pelagianism? Pelagianism is an ancient heresy that was uh, taught by Pelagius. It goes all the way back to the time period of the 5th century uh, with, uh, with Augustine. Augustine refuted Pelagius and eventually Pelagius' ideas were condemned as a heresy. Pelagius taught that every human being is born like Adam before he fell, so that we have free will, we have free choice, and ultimately through our choices we can either choose our way to damnation or we can choose our way unto salvation. It's up to you. Okay, so we can uh, attain divine status through the pursuit of philosophy, according to Pico. So for both Plato uh, and to a lesser extent Aristotle, we can overcome death through the intellect. Both in Plato and Aristotle, uh, there is a kind of uh, ability to overcome death and move on into a different world. Now, for Plato, it was what was called transmigration of the souls, a kind of a reincarnation. Now, in Aristotle, uh, in his De Anima, it's less obvious what he was talking about, but he said that our active intellect, and by that we think that he's discussing or talking about our free will and our rational cap capabilities, those could survive death, according to, to Aristotle. Uh, Pico states, quote, finally, it is not freedom from a body, but it's spiritual intelligence which makes you an angel. If you see a man dedicated to his stomach, crawling on the ground, you see a plant and not a man. Or if you see a man bedazzled by the empty forms of the imagination, as by the wiles of Calypso, and through their alluring solicitations made a slave to his own senses, you see a brute and not a man. If, however, you see a philosopher judging and distinguishing all things according to the rule of reason, him shall you hold in veneration, for he is a creature of heaven and not of earth. If, finally, a pure contemplator, unmindful of the body, wholly withdrawn in the inner chambers of the mind, here indeed is neither a creature of, of earth nor a heavenly creature, but some higher divinity clothed in human flesh. It's statements like this that got Pico in a lot of trouble. He's basically talking about human beings becoming God. Uh, th sometimes we could call this theosis. That is that human beings through their choice have the ability to choose their way into Godhood. So humans can partake of the nature of the seraphim and the cherubim angels, spiritual beings of intelligence, reason, purity, and virtue. We can transform into sublime natures of God's highest creations. We must put away all fleshly impulses, live a kind of ascetic life, 
uh, and contemplate purity and divinity. Pico weaves an eccentric and eclectic array of teachings to show that many religions and traditions believe that human beings can choose their way into becoming like the angels. In the Bible, Pico employs Paul, Job, Jacob's Ladder in Genesis. He appeals to the mystery religions. He appeals to Neoplatonism, to Pythagoreanism. He appeals to the Chaldeans and the Zoroastrian philosophy to support his views. Essentially, Pico is pulling everywhere he can from all of the ancient religions that were possible in order to create a kind of a synthesis that around Christianity. He was a Christian, but he's trying to synthesize all of the other religions with Christianity all around the basic principle that human beings can choose their way into divinity. So he holds that the philosophical life trains and conditions people to cultivate reason over their fleshly and bestial natures. For Pico, philosophy liberates the soul. It benefits humanity, and philosophy supports Christian theology. As such, Pico saw his wide-ranging efforts to employ many traditions as supporting Christianity, salvation, and the building up of individuals. He says, quote, philosophy has taught me to rely on my own convictions rather than on the judgments of others and to concern myself less with whether I am well thought of than whether what I say or do is evil. In other words, he's saying, think for yourself, or as the ancient dictum said, know thyself, or as Socrates said, don't live an unexamined life. This is the value of philosophy. It leads him to a higher life and not a base life of the flesh. This leads Pico to finally claim that many philosophical traditions, including, for example, the Kabbalah and magic, that all of these can make us into loftier human beings uh, of, of high human intellect. Pico's wide ranging mind pulled together a vast eclectic tapestry of ideas from sources, but it was all centered on his conception of the Christian worldview. Now, of course, not all theologians would agree, would agree that Pico's Christian worldview was correct, uh, so he, but he did have at least a Christian worldview, and what he's trying to do is to just draw from anywhere that he possibly can, his wide-ranging mind, looking at all this ancient wisdom that he's recovering. Uh, for example, the Kabbalah, which very few people knew of in his day and age, drawing from these sources of wisdom and essentially bringing them in to support his view of Christianity. Now, his views on free will unto salvific uh, transformation lean toward Pelagianism, which I've already mentioned was a denounced heresy. Uh, Pico decries the closed-mindedness of many of those people in Florence who refused to consider their truth from far-ranging sources. They despised his brilliance and his, his uh, youth, he said. Uh, he was only 24 when he was disputing these things and was a very brilliant uh, young man, uh, but many people despised him and his views and refused to listen to him. For him, all truth overlaps and intertwines. All truth is God's truth, so to speak, even if it's from other systems of thought. Again, Aquinas had done this, but only with Aristotle. Pico opens it up to any and everything. And so he's trying to uh, accommodate any worldview and show that it supports Christianity. He's not the first to engage in such projects. Uh, the, even in the ancient world, uh, going back to classical era of Christianity, uh, there were philosophers who did the same thing, with, mostly with the Greek philosophers, Christian philosophers who wanted to see the Greek philosophy as saying the same thing as Christianity. Okay, uh, just a martyr would be a great example of that. Uh, this refusal to stay in one school of thought seemed to him to be a great strength and not a weakness. In other words, it would just further support his Christian views. He did not see it as a weakness. He saw it as being a very strong uh, position. His conclusions sought to harmonize any and all thought systems known to Renaissance Europe, even magic and Kabbalah. Good magic practiced by Zoroaster greatly advances humanity, he said, in the pursuit of their angelic natures. The Kabbalah means the reception of hidden knowledge. It's a form of Hebrew or Jewish mysticism. And few in the Renaissance Italy had ever even heard of it. But Pico had recovered much of this and believes that the revelations found in Kabbalah 
could assist our pursuit of the angelic nature and unlock much of the meaning of the Old Testament. What can we conclude about uh, Pico? Pico de Mirandola uh, exalted the dignity of humanity and its unique central position in the cosmic order. He syncretized all known belief systems to Christianity around the guiding tenet that an individual can transform himself by free will into an angelic nature of divine nature. Uh, this entails continual choice to rise above our fleshly and bestial natures uh, through the use of the intellect. What are some of the implications that follow from Pico's thought? Pico's pro-human, if not Promethean stance shows his true nature as a humanist. Prometheanism is essentially uh, taking humanity to the point of divinity. He believes that we can become divine creatures, and this is Promethean. He sought to take away, uh, take any kind of, of wisdom that he could from the ancient world and bring it into the practice of human moral transformation. He's very interested in moral transformation. He has to relax his Christian worldview somewhat to do this so that he can incorporate anything that does not contradict Christianity. This creates a lot of common ground between these different thought systems such as the Kabbalah and Zoroastrianism and Christianity. He's never one to throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater, and so he scours all these ancient traditions for any type of wisdom to engender a higher life of intellect and reason and theosis.